I feel like such an imposter up here on so many levels. Um, what I uh, know of statistics could get me revoked uh, out of uh, Saber and uh, I'm a storyteller, uh, not a facts guy. But I got a little story for you. I hope that you find it interesting. I can do it in 20 minutes. And um, so uh, bear with me if you will. In 1950 or thereabouts, a group of itinerant railroad workers, they were called Gandhi dancers, uh, were stationed in a little town called Julian, Nebraska. Sometime that summer, they played a game of baseball against the local team. And um, that's that. Now, <laughs> Um, for years, that just sat in my uh, memory because that was a family lore. This was hometown lore. Um, that was 1950 when that happened. In 2008, we had the election of the first African-American president of the United States. And suddenly this trivial sort of anecdotal memory seemed a little more important. And uh, I decided to go back and research it and uh, find out the facts and make a book out of it. And um, that book was going to be really good. And it was going to have all the facts that I would uncover. And it would be published by the second Obama administration and in 2012 and uh, probably win a Pulitzer Prize. Okay, things don't always work out like we thought they would. And um, the book was finally published as Raven Season in 2023, last year. And um, um, it's called A Novel of Race, Railroads, and Baseball. One of the reasons I had the audacity to call it the game of the century, question mark, was that there was another part of the story. Um, after the game, as the legend goes, there was a picnic. There was a picnic of the, the track workers and the um, local farmers. Um, and um, so this was um, the grandsons of slaves and the grandsons and daughters of homesteaders at a table of brotherhood. And that suddenly seemed to make it a little more important uh, outside of the game of baseball. And I was determined to research that too. Um, I thought we were on the way to banishing racism in this country. I'm a big fan of Barack Obama. And um, as we say, things don't always turn out the way that we thought. So the book that came out in 2023 is a little more hard edged, a little more bitter, uh, not quite as optimistic and celebratory as I had planned in 20, uh, 2008 when I started. Um, but Nevertheless, um, those pictures I just showed you, um, those are fake. I just put those up there. I stole them off the internet. They're not the real thing. Um, <laughs> here's the real thing. These are the people that I interviewed uh, in my ethnographic work between uh, 2008 and 2010. Um, and uh, this is just a small sample. There were uh, more than 100 people that I interviewed in that time. Um, my kind of research is soft research. It's more ethnographic. It's more interviewing. And um, these are some of the people I interviewed and um, came up with uh, two problems. Uh, one of the problems was that um, I show you some of the people I interviewed who were living during the time of the game, but I don't show you all the headstones of all the people who were dead by 2008, and um, including my own parents, my aunts and uncles, and everybody who had connection to this story I grew up with. So from the people I was able to talk to, I got a lot of conflicting ideas, afflicting reports. Some said there was a game, some not. Some said there was a picnic, some not. Other people said other things. Uh, it's when it switched from being a potential nonfiction book to a novel, because that was my only choice. Um, the other problem, as you'll note, is that there are only white faces here. Um, 
Where were the Gandhi dancers? How was I going to interview them? Um, well, they were an itinerary group. Um, so they just came through and were only stationed there for a few weeks. And more than that, they were from Arkansas. I managed to cover that much. And more than that, they, the whole entire job disappeared by 1954-55, all the uh, jobs of the Gandhi dancer were mechanized. And so there wasn't even a, a heritage of that. Um, so here I am trying to put this game together and I came up with the baseball plot for it. Let's make it a really good game because I did learn from these people that the, the Julian team was really, really good. And so the question became, what's the big question? The big question is, what would it take for a makeshift team of Arkansas track workers to be able to compete with a perennial championship team from a fiercely competitive Nebraska Country League? And the answer is, of course, they need a ringer. And the one person that in my research I was able to track down I found my ringer, and I'm going to introduce him to you now. Um, my ringer is Clarence Ace Hill of Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, that's when I interviewed him in uh, 2008 at age 77. Those are some of his combinations and the words behind him. Uh, in my novel, Ace Hill becomes the model for Jerome Wallace a fictional Omaha bricklayer and former barnstormer who once toured with Ace and the Sioux City Ghost. Jerome is my ringer in the novel who evens up the sides and makes it a kind of game of the century. Uh, I wanna just dig in a little bit to Ace Hill um, because this is the, uh, he was the most impressive person that I, I interviewed. I was just, um, I have spent more than two hours with him. Uh, and um, I have a, a, a terrible admission to make here that he didn't play baseball. <laughs> um, he played for the Sioux City Ghosts, a fast hitch softball team, uh, barnstorming team. And uh, in one way, this disappointed me because I wanted this to be a book about baseball, but I'd already learned from all my interviews in Nebraska that it was fast pitch softball, almost certainly, because that's what they were doing at that place at that time. Um, the Sioux City Ghosts were an all black fast pitch softball team, started in Sioux City and began touring in the United States, Canada, Mexico in the 30s, played until 1956. Because of their pranks on the softball field, they were often, and here's where I ran out of room, um, they're often seen as a form uh, compared to the Harlem Globetrotters. And indeed, they actually challenged the Harlem Globetrotters to a, to a, uh, a game which never actually happened, although they did play against Joe Lewis's team a couple times. Joe Lewis had a barnstorming team, the boxer Joe Lewis. Um, so I just want to uh, honor Ace Hill here. And this picture that I took there, he's wearing his softball Hall of Fame uh, hat. And um, he was, as from his 2014, 2014 obituary, Betsy Freeman wrote, he was a star pitcher on the fast pitch softball teams in Omaha's Hay, in the game's Omaha heyday. He threw for state championship team at age 16, went on the road with the barnstorming Sioux City Ghosts in 47 and was named Omaha Player of the Year in 57. Dick Chatelain is a, a well-respected sports writer in the state of Nebraska. And in 2019, he wrote, by 1944, Omaha had more than 200 men's softball teams, including several on the near north side. Phenom pitcher Clarence Ace Hill pitched for a state champion at 16 and toured the country as a higher gun in 74. His windmill arm motion intimidated batters. Um, I threw that thing 100 miles an hour, at least 80 or 90. I had a change up, a riser, a drop. I threw it between my legs, behind my back. And Chatelaine goes on to say, interestingly, that Bob Gibson might have been the next Ace Hill if Jackie Robinson hadn't come along. 
before he dazzled overhand, Gibson, who was from Omaha, as you know, uh, was that da dazzled, um, dominated underhand for the Kellum in the school league. Um, in my book, I honor Ace Hill by making him the only character in the novel who is named as himself. Um, part of the book uh, includes bits of the interview from 2008. In the main action of Brave and Season, the, the, the part that gets set in 1950, he remains off stage, already a near mythical figure in fast pitch softball history. So I'm doing well here. Um, the um, last part of my um, presentation is uh, I'm just going to read to you from a uh, short section, five minute section uh, of the book to show you how I am incorporating um, Ace Hill into my, into my work. Um, I thought at one point I was gonna have to make a case for why soft, fast pitch softball should be um, treated as a legitimate and serious sport. Um, but I think the Women's World Series playoffs have done that for me. Anybody who has watched CNN or, or ESPN already knows that, so I won't go, with, I won't go there. Um, the little section that I'm going to read is, uh, takes place uh, right after uh, Jerome is coaching up the Gandhi dancers to be uh, a real team. And he calls them idiots or something because they, they never heard of Ace Hill. <clears throat> we do literary readings a lot in my field and uh, it's always hard to follow along. So I find that if, if you can see the text, maybe you can follow along a little better. He had their attention now. Who's this Ace Hill play for? It came from George, the fact man. He played for a lot of teams, Jerome said. In 1944, when he was just 15, he pitched the first Negro team to a Nebraska State Championship in fast pitch for armor meatpacking. In 1946, he did it, almost did it again, playing for Omaha Brick and Tile. Isn't that where you were, George said? You said almost, Sam put in. What happened? In 47 and 48, they went on the road. Jerome continued barnstorming. Ace played with Bob Rogers, Tank Hamilton, Popeye Smith, those boys. Rogers was the player manager. He could hit the ball a mile. They were called the Sioux City Ghosts on account of they were run by a big guy out of Sioux City, Iowa, named Fisher. Fatty Fisher, we called him. Fisher, he'd go ahead and set up the games, and these nine boys, nine colored boys, they would play seven nights a week, taking on teams in country towns. Often as not, they'd have to sleep in their cars because there was no place in town who would take them. But at every game, the stands were full to bursting with people come out to see their homeboys play the colored fast team in fast pitch, play and lose to the colored team, as it turned out. George would not let it go. Were you on that team? Jerome bounced the softball several times on the end of his back. This one time, it was the 4th of July, and the ghosts were playing in a town called Beatrice, not far from here. There was a carnival set up out past the outfield fence with rides and a midway and all that, including a Ferris wheel. They got Ferris wheels in Arkansas? We got Ferris wheels, said Big Larry. Ace Hill, he goes to the mound in the first inning, and this giant of a white boy comes up to bat. The boy is big as a house. So, of course, Bob Rogers and Ace do some clowning about how big he is, pretending they're afraid of him and all that. It was part of the show. Every time the boy settled in with his bat, Rogers, who was catching, sneaks up behind the boy, acting like he was going to try to pull his pants down, but he's too scared. The crowd was almost wetting themselves. Jerome smiled to himself. So then the boy finally settles in and Ace deals him a pitch and damn if that boy didn't get a hold of it. Those carnival rides were out there past the fence and we watched that ball go up and up and over the Ferris wheel. 
over the Ferris wheel, said Del Ram, clean over it. And everybody said they'd never seen a ball hit so far in the entire planet. So Ace and Rogers played it up and the crowd went wild. They almost stomped the bleachers to bits from laughing and clapping and all that. Jerome paused and looked at the rapt faces of the men circled around him. Cook, standing behind, gave him a wink. Three innings later, Jerome went on, the big boy comes up to bat again. Ace had struck out every one of them, and there here was their Babe Ruth a second time. Instead of clowning with the boy, this time Rogers sends the whole team to sit on the bench, all except Ace. Then Rogers puts on his mask and gets behind the plate. The crowd, they thought this was real funny, and the big white boy, he was smiling. They thought Rogers was conceding another home run, so there wasn't any point to have even have fielders out there. So Ace went into his windup, and Jerome paused, smiling, looking around. What happened, cried the boys. What happened? Struck him out on three pitches. A cheer went up from the Gandys. Who won, George asked. Those ghosts never lost when they played serious. After two innings of forcing around, they always played serious. Jerome took a step back from the boys. He tossed the ball in the air and with sudden savage swing, sent it a mile in the air in the direction of the grain elevator. If there had been a Ferris wheel on the gravel road, that ball would have gone over it. Hey, that's my ball, shouted Ice. You better go get it then, said Jerome, handing him the bat and walking away. Thank you for uh, listening to that um, little bit of book. Um, I know this is narrative. This is not the factual stuff, but uh, I hope you'll uh, consider reading it. And um, even as a, a more of an imposter, I'm going to do what we do in literary circles. And I'm going to like self-promote shamelessly here and uh, say that... Um, the, the book is called Brazen Season. It's available from the publisher or Amazon. And we just have a new Audible version out um, with a really good reader. And um, I got some copies. I'll sell them for 20 bucks each, cheap. And, um, and otherwise, you can get them. And thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, not a question, a comment. Uh, for about 30 years, I taught baseball classes in, in college. Uh, never apologize. <laughs> uh, like a narrative and myth. Students walk in my class and they're all economics and computer science majors, and I say, this is a class of narrative and myth. You won't hear a number in it. You got me, dude. I was faking it. I'm really proud of this book. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's terribly important that you were here. Yes. Can you, uh, I don't have to probably read this in your book, but can you elaborate a little bit more on the Gandhi dancers? Yeah. Um, I love the Gandhi dancers. The subtitle to the book is a novel of race, railroads, and um, baseball. And I did as much research into railroads as into baseball. The Gandhi dancers were a team of men that worked together to uh, rip and replace the rails. As it happened, if you want to go wonky on you, uh, in 1950, their dieselization was going on. They had to replace 95 pound rail with 115 pound rail. They were working on the Mopac main line from Kansas City to Omaha. And they were a, what they call a system gang, which is the highest level gang. And a really cool thing about the gang is that they worked with a song caller. And the song caller, as with work songs uh, of other kinds, would call out the beat and sing a song when they carried a rail, because the rails weighed something like 1,400 pounds each. And it took 10 men to lift them and carry them. And if they made one mistake, people got severely injured. And so in my book, I have a, um, a one of the characters is a song caller. And um, and does the does the song uh, on the rails for the men and um, <clears throat> and 
uh, the, I, I got the, the guy who does the audible version. He's also a singer. He does a great job on the uh, the song caller part. Does that answer some of your questions? Yes, thank you. The um, Gandhi dancers were of all races. The one that came to Julian that year happened to be all African American, except the 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 foreman, of course, who was white. Um, I did interview in Arkansas the first black foreman on the Missouri Pacific Railroad, uh, an amazing guy. Um, anyway, uh, but across the country, before it all became mechanized, um, there were Chinese people, there were white people, there were black people, there were, um, you know, Scandinavians. It was, it was, but this group happened to be all African American. I just like to add a point of information on uh, the topic of uh, black baseball players working for the railroads, not serving on the trains, but the the Dallas Black Stockings, at least from 1883 to 1891, these guys were railroad men. They made brick, they planted uh, railing. So the idea that black baseball players worked on the railroads as well traces back to the 19th century. Yeah, and it comes up in the book when the farmers are all surprised that these guys are great hitters. Um, their foreman laughs at them and says, what do you think these guys have been doing all summer? <laughs> they've been hitting rails. I mean, they've been hitting spikes that are about this big um, every day, all day. So uh, yeah, maybe they could be pretty good baseball hitters. Any other questions? We can can we give our presenter again a round of applause? <laughs>